Everyone who watched Wimbledon last year remembers the amazing moment when the British champion Rodney Maitland stormed off the centre court after an angry argument with the umpire. Two games down in the second set, he threw his racket down and made an insulting gesture to the booing crowd, then ran off to the clubhouse, refusing to talk to pressmen and smashing the camera of one of them. Next morning, 200 miles away in Fulchester, near the home of his girlfriend, Gail Holt Matthews, he was found unconscious in a hotel bath, with both wrists slashed. A suicide note was found in the bedroom, and as a result of what he wrote in it, Roddy is today in the dock, facing a charge of criminal libel. He's pleaded not guilty, and further pleads justification. Mr Jonathan Fry, QC, has finished his opening speech for the Crown, and is examining his first witness. <laughs> Establish what took place. Detective Inspector Revel, after you went to the Merton Lodge Hotel at midnight, in answer to this telephone call, what did you find? Well, I went to room number 21 on the first floor with the proprietors, Mrs. Hooper. One of the hotel servants was trying to force open the door of the bathroom, which was bolted from the inside. I and the police constable who was with me succeeded in breaking down the door and we went in. Without going into too many details, Inspector, would you tell us what you found once you'd broken down the bathroom door? The accused was lying in the bath naked and apparently unconscious. The taps were open and the water was overflowing and running onto the floor. It was heavily discoloured with blood. And what did you do then? The constable and I pulled him out and laid him on the floor. Did you see anything that might account for the blood? Yes, the accused had gashes on both wrists. Deep or superficial, would you say? Well, I had no chance to make a full examination. The doctor arrived a minute or two after I did. While he was attending to the accused, I had a look around the bedroom. And what did you find there, Inspector? Well, the bed had not been slept in, and there was an overnight case standing on a chair. Also some clothes hanging from a cupboard. Did you find anything else? Yes, on the table by the bedside, there was a sealed envelope. Was it addressed in any way? Yes, it was addressed to Dr. D. Holt Matthews, the old forge, Medley Green. And what became of that letter? I took it away. I thought it might be evidence. With regard to the apparent attempt at suicide? Yes. Um, did you subsequently read this letter? Yes. It is Exhibit 1, my lord. Could it be given to the witness, please? Very well, Mr. Fry. <coughs> <coughs> Inspector Revel, would you read the letter to the court, please? Uh, Dr. Holt Matthews, I don't suppose it'll bother you too much, but when you read this, I'll be dead. As dead as that baby of mine and Gail's you butchered so casually. At least I only have the killing of myself on my conscience. What's on yours? How does it feel to be a murderer? Yours without forgiveness, Rodney Maitland. May the jury see the letter, Mr. Certainly, Mr. Brown. Inspector Revel, did you subsequently show this letter to anyone else? Yes, the following day I took it to the accused, the person to whom it was uh, addressed. To Dr. Holt Matthews? Uh, that is correct. And did he read this letter in your presence? Yes. And did he make any comment about it? Well, he seemed very angry and upset. He said that if he had Maitland there, he'd beat the living daylights out of him. At that time, Maitland was in hospital, wasn't he? Yes. Do you know what his condition was then? Uh, that precise time, I couldn't say. In general terms, was he expected to live? Well, I believe his condition was serious, but a couple of days later he was off the danger list. Being an unusually athletic and robust young man? I suppose so. He's a very well-known sportsman. He recovered quite quickly, in fact, didn't he? Yes. Uh, turning now to the letter, what do you understand it to mean? Well, it seemed to make a very serious allegation against the doctor of professional misconduct. And what did you understand to be the nature of this allegation? Well, it appeared to accuse the doctor of performing an illegal operation on his own daughter. This is the gale that is mentioned in the letter? Yes. Have you made any inquiries into the truth of these allegations? Yes. As a result of these inquiries, Inspector, would you tell us briefly what are your conclusions? Well, I've known the family for several years. And as a result of my inquiries, it appeared there was no basis for the allegations whatsoever. Thank you. <clears throat> Inspector Revel, do you make a habit of purloining other people's correspondence? Well, it depends on the circumstances. If a crime has been committed... But it hadn't, had it? A suicide is no longer a criminal offence, is it, Inspector? Uh, no, sir. No. 
The letter was in a sealed envelope addressed <clears throat> to Dr. Holt Matthews. Why did you not deliver it to Dr. Holt Matthews? I did, sir. Yes, after reading it yourself. Well, I thought it might be needed as evidence. Evidence of what? Well, of his state of mind when they held the inquest. Oh, but you soon found out there wasn't going to be an inquest because Mr. Maitland was not going to die. Now, when precisely did you learn that he was out of danger? I believe it's as I've already stated. That is, a couple of days later. You're quite sure you weren't already in possession of that knowledge when you took it upon yourself to show this letter to Dr. Holt Matthews? Uh, quite sure, sir. Because if you had known that, it would have been very irresponsible of you to have shown the letter to the doctor, would it not? It couldn't be suppressed, sir. But surely you must have realised the trouble which would result by your showing it to him. But I'd already shown the contents to my superior. Ah. Now, you didn't say that in your evidence-in-chief when my learned friend asked you who else had read the letter. Well, I'm sorry, sir, but naturally the matter was discussed at a higher level in view of the seriousness of the allegations. Even if the accused had died, the police would still have been bound to look into them. Using the letter, no doubt, as deathbed evidence. Well, if there were any other grounds for the prosecution, if there was anything to corroborate the charge... Well, there have been no proceedings against Dr Holt Matthews for criminal abortion, have there? No, sir. Why not? Well, there wasn't a, a single ground of corroboration in anything that he'd written. Final... Uh, Dr Holt Matthews is very well respected locally. Final question, Inspector. Are you acquainted with Dr. Holt Matthews socially? Oh, uh, yes, sir. Thank you. That's all. Why, have you any further questions for this witness? I know, Lord. I'd like to call uh, Dr. Holt Matthews. What's the legend on you, please? Thank you. Take the Bible in your right hand, please, and read the words on the card. I swear by Almighty God, the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Is your full name Dennis MacArthur Holt Matthews? Yes. Do you live at the Old Forge, Medley Green? I do, yes. And you are a doctor of medicine? Yes. How long have you been practicing, doctor? I qualified in 1951. Since then, I've been in general practice. I believe you're married with one child, your daughter Gail. Yes. She's uh, 16 and a half now, isn't she? Yes. What are your interests, Doctor, apart from medicine? Now, I've always been interested in sport, particularly in tennis. I'm chairman of the Fulchester Lawn Tennis Club. Is that interest shared by your daughter, Gail? Yes, she's very keen. I think she has the makings of a first-class player. She was entered for the junior championships at Bournemouth, but she was obliged to withdraw because, well, she wasn't well. That would have been shortly after the events which we are now considering. Yes. When she was just 16, in fact. Yes. Right. Well, can we return to the time? Was it through the interest in tennis that you first met the accused? Yes. He is, of course, a very well-known player. When my daughter brought him to the house, I was at first delighted. At first, Doctor? Well, I admired him very much as a sportsman. I was prepared to make allowances. Allowances for what? One of the things I admire about sport is that it gives young people an ideal. It shows them what can be achieved by self-discipline and a, a generally healthy outlook. If you lose that, you've got nothing. I can't get used to these so-called superstars with their degenerate appearance and their lack of self-control. So that although you admired Roddy Maitland as a player... Well, not even that for long. I thought his behaviour at Wimbledon was quite disgraceful. I'd like to come now to your first meeting with the accused. Um, did you have um, any reason to complain of his conduct at that time? No, I don't think so. I went out of my way to make myself agreeable. I suppose I was gratified that he should take so much interest in my daughter's game. And he was an excellent coach. She took his advice far more readily than ever she took mine. She was just 16 at the time? Yes. Though she was always young for her age. And she behaved in a rather silly way over Maitland, more like a schoolgirl crush, collecting his photographs, that kind of thing, as though he was some kind of pop star. A few months after this first meeting, did you have occasion to give a medical examination to your daughter? Yes. My daughter had been complaining of headaches and general debility. She was due to play in this tournament at Bournemouth. I thought at first she was making excuses to get out of it. She'd become rather easily depressed and wasn't showing her usual competitive spirit, I'm afraid. So I insisted on making a general examination. You are, of course, her doctor, 
as well as her parent. Yes. Though on this occasion she did say she'd prefer to go to someone else. However, I saw no point in that. What did you find when you examined her, Doctor? I found she was about two months pregnant. And what did you say to her about it? Well, I told her it was quite obvious who the father was. And she'd made a damn fool of herself. Probably ruined her career. My daughter could have been a first-class player. But with an unwanted baby to bring up, obviously she wouldn't stand a chance. Was the subject of marriage mentioned at this time? Yes. She said it was up to Maitland. As far as she was concerned, it didn't matter one way or the other. That showed me how much she'd come under his rotten influence. She almost gloried in the prospect of being an unmarried mother. Did you say anything about it to Maitland? No, he was out of the country at the time, playing in California, I believe. Do you know if Gail tried to get in touch with him? No, I forbade her to. I don't think there was any communication between them until he returned to England. And when was that? About ten days or a fortnight later, at the start of June. He came back for Wimbledon, of course. I told Gail not to accept any calls from him, and her mother had the same instructions. But in spite of these precautions, the call came through? Yes. She announced she'd had a long talk with him. They decide, she decided to leave home and go to London. After the championships, they'd decide whether they should get married. Your consent, of course, would be required for that. Yes, I pointed that out. She said if I withheld it, they'd live together openly. I thought that was a, a dreadful prospect. Did you make any alternative suggestion, Doctor? Yes, I said that we could arrange for the baby to be adopted. Did you at any time suggest a termination of the pregnancy? Certainly not. Now, Doctor, will you tell us what was the course of your daughter's pregnancy? She miscarried on June the 15th. And would you tell the court the circumstances, please? Yes. My daughter had been in a very nervous, depressed condition. She refused to eat. That evening, just before dinner, she complained of nausea, said she was going to her room. She went along the passage. The house is a single-story one. And a few minutes after, I heard the sound of a body falling. I hurried to Gail's room and found her lying on the floor. She had evidently fainted, but in falling, she'd struck her head on a table. There were several minor lacerations. Did you leave her in the bedroom? No, my wife came in, and together we carried her into the surgery. Was she conscious? No, it was about 30 minutes before she recovered consciousness. And during that time, she had a miscarriage. In the surgery? Yes. Now, Doctor, I have to ask you this. Did you in any way procure that miscarriage? No, I did not. Is there any truth whatever in the allegations written by the accused that it was in fact a deliberate abortion? No, sir. None whatever. And when after these events did you next see the accused? It was on June the 29th, the day of the semi-finals of the men's singles. I'd been watching him on television, making a fool of himself, shouting at the umpire. And about 10 o'clock that evening, he turned up at the house, demanding to see Gail. I told him to clear out. What else did you tell him, Doctor? I told him it was no use his pestering the girl. The affair was over. And what did he reply to that? I forget exactly. I think he said something about what was to become of the child. I, I'm afraid that made me lose my temper. He was so sure of himself, so truculent. What did you say, Doctor? I said that little problem had been settled by an act of God.